Yes. So we, we have time for questions.
sigma. What is called the Yeah. Right? So, for people who don't know, um, Dr. Alan Hutchinson is going to talk Medication species, do they come from uh, which part of the world? Do they? Because you're north of Vietnam, so it's 21 degrees uh, latitude, which is quite a long way to be related to this question here, I I just wonder if they do suffer from uh, cold during the winter or where do they come from originally? It's, it's still from uh, Asia, 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 Asia. From whereabouts? From where else? I like starting off by acknowledging the people who make it happen, and there are three categories of people I would like to acknowledge. First are my PhD masters and honor students. They are the food soldiers that get the work done. So I uh, really appreciate the time and effort they put into that. And then the Australian Wool Education Trust, CSIRO National Research Flagship, ACR and Utahs have been the main sponsors of the work that we do, and we're grateful to them. Lastly, but not the least, are the farmers, the industry, that give us the animals, that give us access to their farms, and also that give us facilities. We uh, totally acknowledge them. I am assuming that there are people in the audience who are probably not familiar with what our research group does. So I'll try to give a bit of an overview about what meat production is, the fat and, and the descriptors of lean meat, talk a bit about PUFAs, and then look at phenotypic variation and how we can quantify that. And perhaps give you a very tiny brief uh, trend that happens in the industry at the moment, and then I'll focus on some bit of uh, objectives, and I'll round it up with uh, some take home messages. So the starting point for producing meat, I beg your pardon, and I'm speaking about meat coming from sheep, but I'm using beef cattle uh, as an example. But it starts off with the female giving birth to the young one, and from milk suckling right up to when they are weaned, either on grains or moved onto pastures, they go through that process where you are gradually monitoring them until they reach the feedlot. Uh, in situations where you are giving them accelerated uh, growth access. And um, their meat is produced and finally it ends you know, on our plates for those of us who are meat eaters. Now, when you want to describe uh, what lean meat is, usually there are three categories of fat that is within the meat. There is one that is just outside the immediate cut or the separable fat. That's what we call the subcutaneous fat. And then you have other fat that sort of join between two muscles 
and you call that intermuscular fat. And then there is the third category that is within the muscle, the edible part itself, that you cannot separate. And that's what we refer to as intramuscular fat or marbling that most people will talk about. So it is the core of what we are interested in, the sort of fats that come in with the meat and why are we interested in the lean meat. So if you go to a supermarket or to a butchery, what you see is that there is the untrimmed meat that has the muscle, the external fat, and also the internal fat. Or you would find one that is semi-trimmed, or you find one that doesn't have any fat at all. And depending on consumer preferences, you find that the um, preference is more towards the lean red meat. So what ends up in the plate then that makes it really desirable is something like this where it is lean, it is juicy, it has a lot of flavor, and begins to stimulate the saliva in your mouth. And that is exactly what we aim to sort of uh, get across to our consumers. Now, why PUFAs? Why polyunsaturated fatty acids? Why are we interested in them? For one, these are fatty acids that cannot ordinarily be synthesized, so they are essential. They have to be provided one way or the other, either in the diet or so. And we have the categories of omega-3 and omega-6. Um, most of the omega-6 and the omega-3 can actually be gotten from seafood. Uh, so people that eat fish, for instance, get heaps of supplies of those. Whereas in sheep and other uh, meat-producing animals, there are very little levels. So the aim is to see if we can use nutritional manipulation to up the levels in the lamb that we eat. The other reason why we're interested in polyunsaturated fatty acids is that they are linked to flavor and tenderness in meat, which are desirable meat qualities. The other thing too is that they have anti-cholesterolomic effect. That means that they sort of help lower cholesterol levels, and so reduce the incidence of uh, heart attacks and so on. But what you would notice is that it's a complex step along the line. Uh, and in each step, you will find different delta-6, for instance, desaturase as an enzyme converting ALA to C1814, C1814, sorry, and you have elongase and delta-5 desaturase. So all of these steps are actually catalyzed by enzymes. Now, I wouldn't want to go into the details of the biochemistry, but these enzymes are key to what we try to quantify and see if there are links between them and gene clusters, which we believe have an impact on meat quality. So as geneticists, the main tool that we use is phenotypic variation, and that is the differences that you can observe, quantify, and actually measure. And if you look at marbling, different cuts from different animals would have different levels of marbling, from very lean to also <coughs> very marbled here. So if you're going through a normal uh, population distribution, you would have this bell-shaped uh, curve where the majority of the animals might fall within the middle. But along the line, you might be able to identify animals that are on the two extremes. Some that are to the high extreme here, and some that are to the high extreme around here. So the variation gives us that tool to be able to carry out selection. But what you see as the phenotype, the marbling, for instance, that you see in a cat, is not just because of the genetics that that animal inherited from its parents, but it's also a combination of what the environment is able to add to that. And to expand a little bit about the environment there, this will include things like the nutrition that you give the animal, the health aspect, and other things that are within your control. If the environment is favorable, then you will be able to see the genetic impact a bit more. And we can then use the variance that is due to the genotype and the variance that is due to the phenotype to calculate what we call heritability, or what is inherited from the parents. And on that basis, EBVs, or estimated breeding values, are developed for the industry. And along these EBV lines, you can select your rams for breeding, and so on and so forth. Coming to the sheep industry, the two trends I just want to quickly point out is that 
over the last couple of years, maybe 20 or so, the line in blue there shows that wool production has been going down. On the other hand, the green line shows that the fat, uh, I mean meat production has been on the increase. So for the farmer who is using sheep in the industry, he should be able to be flexible to adjust and adapt to the market trends where if the emphasis is now more on the meat bringing in more money, then dual purpose breeding comes in. In terms of dollar amounts, as of 2011, there was an increase in sheep meat value from about 0.5 billion to 2.2 billion dollars, whereas the wool production decreased from about 6 billion to 2.5 billion dollars. And because sheep farming is all about meeting the expectations of the consumer. Uh, we do know that there's high demand for LC omega-3 PUFAs for the reasons I've mentioned before, health reasons. If we feed animals nutritionally, we can change that, but that change is only temporary and is very variable. So the genetic approach then enables us to be able to <coughs> maintain that cumulative sustainability that's passed from parents to offspring. And that's where the use of crossbreeding comes in, uh, where you want to blend wool quality growth and also the carcass quality into a single animal. Traditionally in Australia, the border lester has been the major, major maternal breeder over the last 80 or more years. But 40% of the F1s, or the first female generations that are produced, are uh, merino use. And the merinos are the backbone of the sheep industry in this country. But we do need to conduct research to be able to evaluate the best breed combinations that will respond to the best or optimal feeding levels. That way we can then target markets uh, appropriately. This is where genomics then comes in and the use of proteomics. But this afternoon I'll just focus a bit more on the SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphic markers that we use a lot in our research. And I've listed some few advantages of SNPs over uh, microsatellites, which I wouldn't want to waste too much time on. But with the FATS and uh, FATS1 and FATS2, or what we call the Delta-5 and Delta-6 desaturases, these are the key enzymes in fatty acid metabolism and of interest to our group. And also the fatty acid binding proteins, or the FABP, they are also uh, of interest to us because in cattle, it's been demonstrated that there's an association between FABP4 with marbling and carcass weight. Um, and there's been some other reports too where it's been associated with specific fatty acids. So we are interested in that. But in sheep, unfortunately, there isn't much data published along those lines. And so that is the major uh, gap that we are trying to fill by most of what we do. So the research need is to understand the relationship between fat metabolism related genes and the LC omega-3 PUFAs. Uh, I think different students in the group are looking at different aspects of this. Some are looking at gene expression, others are looking at uh, different aim. But overall, we want to look at the genetic association between the two. So to put it in perspective, what we do in our group is mostly looking at fat metabolism and genetic variation theory, looking at the interactions, and also meat quality, intramuscular marbling. Um, we also look at situations in the feedlot and also in grass-fed situations where cattle or sheep are grazing. So for this talk, I'll go through the experimental design that we used. We had five sire breeds, and these were Texel, Coopworth, these regions, I'll list them uh, in the coming slides. But we fed them two different types of diets, lupins and canola. And we also had two levels of supplementation. Some were fed at 1% of their body weight, others were fed at 2% of their body weight. And to be able to distinguish between the boys and the girls, we looked at both males and females within every given set. And those animals were so we generated about 500 F1s uh, from Merino sire, dam, sorry, and these were the sires uh, listed there. But then after weaning, we chose about 40 of them uh, at an average weight of about 26 kilos. 
and we assign them into four treatments, so for two, uh, five by two by two by two. And these lambs were housed individually uh, so that we could monitor them. The feeding trial lasted nine weeks in each, I mean, each time we ran this, and we had run, we've run several of these trials using canola and lupins and some other feed supplements as well. Um, but we gave them 21 days to adjust to the feed before we started collecting the data. Then that way their gastrointestinal tract got used to the feeds um, and then we could then monitor what they were doing. Last days we collected all the fecal droppings so that we could estimate the digestibility of the animals. Um, daily the routine was going there emptying the, the, the plates, sorry, the collection trays and cleaning, weighing of residual feed, and there was no such thing as Easter break because the animals had to be looked after. So it's very intense. Daily, you have to be there um, weighing and doing all sorts of things. But at the end, we slaughtered the animals. And I should mention that we had to defend this before the ethics committee why the animals had to die even though it's the meat we're interested in and you can't get meat when the animal is alive. But we slaughtered them and looked specifically at the longissimus dosi muscle. That's the muscle at the back. Doesn't do much work, very tender. It's perhaps the most expensive cut of the, the animal. And then we did uh, GC analysis for fatty acids. So just to Put it in perspective, and again, I apologize if you've been to a previous seminar where these photos are coming, but to be able to let you see the animals that we're working with, these were the rams that we were using. You've got the black suffolk, the white suffolk, you've got dorsets, um, and then texel. So for each of those rams, we allocated them to about 100 females in separate paddocks, and, and one ram could, could very easily service about 100 females without any problem. But at the initial stages, we collected the semen. Um, and it was easy to simply just bring the female around um, and then put her in a place where she's restrained. As soon as the ram comes in, the first thing he wants to do is to mount the female. And very quickly, what Chris is holding here and what Will is holding there is what we call the AV, or the artificial vagina. And it's just, we, we can then quickly take samples and look at it under the microscope and then tell whether that ram will be a good breeder. We can estimate morphology, semen volume, and so on and so forth. So that was the first thing we did before breeding them. And at the end, you find this very fine looking F1 progeny that were then the basis of the experiment that we did. And at marking, we had to vaccinate the animals. We had to tag them. We had to make sure that they were accurately ID'd and a whole range of data were collected during that progeny marking. And again, it's a time when we all go as a group to help each other out in taking data because it's not just one man's uh, duty. But if you go to the individual setup that we had where each of these animals was housed individually and there was water that just flew right through those pipes and the animals could drink without anyone being there to give them the water. Uh, and that's because of this setup here that uh, Will actually did a good job at, at setting it up. So these are the individual feeding pens uh, in, in Cambridge with all the feeds, and each of those animals then is housed here where we can monitor how much it's eaten, we can weigh how much is left, we can then take a lot of data on the animal. Um, and then different students, like I said, were working on different aspects. In case you haven't seen the canola before, that's what canola looks like. And this is what uh, lupin uh, look, looks like when it's uh, cracked and ready to feed the animals. And also, I forgot to mention that we also take wool samples at the beginning and at the end. So we shave a particular area here and take the wool sample. And at the end, we also monitor how much wool has grown and we analyze for other wool qualities. We also use that facility for teaching purposes. So apart from our students using that to learn blood collection, we also use that to uh, teach undergraduate students how to condition score the animals, uh, animal handling, 
and they are also a part of the experiment that we run as far as data collection is concerned. Well, the animals are then moved to the abattoir, this is the Longford abattoir, where we uh, take data. I will just quickly skip through some of these photos, but again, these are students that we work very closely with. But after collecting all the data, we come back into the lab. And it's a very long process, and I won't go through that. Instead, I'll just use some of the photos to simply say what we do. So we extract the genomic DNA and look at the quantity of that DNA and the purity using uh, the, the, the nanodrop technique. And from here, you can actually tell between from the DNA we collect from the blood and from the wool, we can look at the quality and assess whether we need to go back and then re-extract and so on and so forth. That is subjected to PCR. The PCR products are annealed. And Arash will probably tell you this better than I do, how long it takes to sort of optimize the PCR conditions from when you are getting blurs like that to when you get a perfect um, outcome. But it takes a lot of fiddling around and getting the conditions set. Then those are loaded into the sequencer um, and again, those are analyzed where we, we do the genotyping. And at the end, you get some, some uh, data. For the FABB4 uh, and the FATS2, these are the, the sequences that we used in order to run that. And I should mention, too, that this will run on a sequence on platform. Okay. When you then begin to crunch the data, it's now aligning and making sure that we are identifying each of the progeny along with the sire. And we use the allele sharing frequency matrix to be sure that we are really getting a perfect match as far as the DNA is concerned between the samples that we've taken. And that way, there are mistakes that we're not sure of. We probably discard the samples. But on the basis of the output, you can then have the number of calls. If there's no call, you find a red. If you have the A allele or the AG, which is the heterozygote, or a G, so with these color matrices, we can then accurately assign each of those uh, animals that we are working with. Um, so on the sequence of the platform, you then end up with this uh, genotyping for each of the animals. Um, Sorry, that's very crowded. I'm just trying to show here that we then go through to look at the minor allele frequencies, major allele frequencies, and then test that expectation on a chi-square. And that's when we then go through statistical analysis. Um, and we use mixed model <coughs> where we're fitting in the phenotype of the individual animal, the fixed effect, which would be breed cell supplement, and then all the covariates and the polygenic effect and parts that we can't account for, that goes in as the residual or the error. For us to be able to then run the association study, we have to use adjusted phenotypes. Okay? And also, we then run a SNP linear regression to be able to arrive at the adjusted phenotype. I think I will just quickly go through the statistics and then I'll go through the results. For the purposes of this seminar, I've only put two tables uh, to be able to show you the results that we've obtained. So as far as the spread or the distribution of the LC omega-3 PUFAs in terms of milligrams per 100 grams, the alpha linoleic acid, if you look at the AA genotype or the AG or GG within the fatty acid binding protein, uh, what we did notice was that there wasn't too much of a difference as far as the quantity of the fatty acid is concerned. Now, when you come to eicosapentaenoic acid, or EPA, what we noticed was that if you have an AA uh, genotype, it was a little bit more than what you got for the GG, <coughs> and so on and so forth. That is at the fatty acid binding protein 4. But when you move to the fatty acid desaturase 2, uh, in some instances, we were not getting any heat at all. So we tried to then run the association study, um, which is, to us, this is the most important part of the long story. Um, and that is, did you get a significant association between a SNP genotype and 
uh, the, the fatty acid. So you would see that for steroidonic acid, or 18,4 omega-3, there was a significant variation, and that was explaining about 11.4% of the phenotypic variation. And the highest that we got, as far as uh, that was concerned, was within the EPA of about 18.6%. Sorry, we had a higher one with the part two explaining about 19.7. So approximately 20% of the observed phenotypic variation could be linked to genotype. And that is really significant. So if you were to summarize all this, the take home message would be that you can achieve some nutritional manipulation of LC omega-3 poofers, their canola and lupin. Um, but then you need to match sheep breeds. I didn't present the results of the responses <coughs> of the different sheep breeds uh, to, to, to the, to the uh, supplements here. But we did see very huge genetic, uh, genetic variation between the different breeds. And also the FADS2 and the fatty acid binding protein 4 uh, could be potential markers that could be used uh, as markers of choice in the prime lamb uh, industry. So in conclusion, I'd like to state that from this work, there is evidence that yes, there is genetic variation between the, uh, the variants <coughs> and lc profile, but those genetic effects may not be very large. So what that means is that the environment has to be conducive as well. And I should mention that in, in terms of associations, if you have 20%, that's actually considered big, even though in terms of numbers it's small, but it's huge genetically. If you can actually attribute 20% of what you are seeing completely to the genes. Um, I should also mention that because we genotyped only 369, even though we started with 500, uh, but we had to discard the others because we were not sure of the, 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 uh, the paternity. So numbers here could be uh, another issue that would have had an impact on this. If we had larger numbers, perhaps we'll get a different result. So I think that's where I want to uh, uh, end the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.